Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Let's open with a word of prayer. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Lord God, you are a wonderful, majestic God. We thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you have done for us, Lord God. We love you, and we thank you for this opportunity, Lord God. Please give me the words to speak and the listeners the ear to hear, ears to hear, Lord God. Please help me to speak truth and let them hear any truth that I might speak and close their ears to anything that I might say that is, that is not right, Lord God. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for your son. Please fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord God, and help us to learn what you would have us learn. We pray this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Herald Society 2014, again, it's uh, Reformers and their doctrine, and since I'm site to bring Kate to do to the website, I get to speak about something else, <laughs> and I'm thankful for that. Again, that's my website, proofthatgodexists.org. If you want a card, they're at my table back there, where you can also get my film, How to Answer the Fool. Um, it's just the media version. It's the full film, but it doesn't have the study guide. If you want that, you're going to have to buy it from Marv Clementosh, womanontracks.com. American Vision is probably still selling it cheaper than me, but I don't get anything from that, so, uh, well, you decide. <laughs> and this t-shirt back there, that's... <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I had that happen to me eight years ago. That's a whole other story. Um, so that shirt there, and then there's this one here, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in atheist. That's the back of the shirt. For those of you who don't uh, know my logo, that's the logo that I came up for the website. And it's the X's and O's with only X's. And people say, you know, what does that mean? Uh, the opposition has no place to go. I said, exactly. <laughs> so they say once the three X's are actually the game's over. I say, well, they keep talking and they just have no place to go. So uh, this talk is epistemology and evangelism. Epistemology and evangelism. Now, of course, I'm going to define epistemology because 10 years ago, I didn't know what it meant. And I've heard the word so often now that I sometimes repeat it and people look at me like, you know, what are you talking about? And I think it's really unfair to use those type of words with people on the street when they don't know what you're talking about, because then you're just being an intellectual snob, and you're bullying people with big words. And I think we shouldn't do that. So epistemology basically is the theory of knowledge. Now, I want to cover four basic people that you're going to meet on the street. People who say they can't know anything at all. People who say they can't know anything for certain. People who say everything is relative and people who say that they can know things without God. Now, before we get into that, though, I'd like to talk about this. Can Christians know anything for certain? My eyes are getting bad, so I've got to make my notes a little bit bigger here. Can Christians know anything with certain, for certain? Now, before we ask that question, people don't even know what certainty means. Even Christians don't know what certainty is, so I want to define it, because there's two types of certainty. The first type of certainty is psychological certainty. And the belief is psychologically certain when the subject who has it is supremely convinced of its truth. So someone who is on drugs might be convinced that there are snakes on the bed. He might be certain that there are snakes on the bed, but it's not necessarily true that there are snakes on the bed. That's psychological certainty. Anyone can have psychological certainty about anything, depending on the state of their mind. But the type of certainty that I want to talk about uh, this afternoon is epistemic certainty. And that's the property of a proposition that it cannot fail to be true. That's what I'm talking about, the certainty. The property of a proposition, then it cannot, cannot fail to be true. Now, here's the question. Do we believe in a probable God or a certain God? As Christians, well, you saw a couple of the clips I played yesterday, and I'm going to play some more today, about how we're taught to defend our faith, and we're not taught to defend our faith in a certainty. Most of the apologetics out there talk about a probability. Well, do we believe in a probable God or a certain God? How do we answer that question? I like to take people to Romans 8, verse 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Out in the world we say nothing can separate us from the love of the Father. Tears streaming down our face. That's a very comforting verse. Nothing can separate us from the love of the Father. That's what we say in church on Sunday. And we're fully assured that nothing can separate us from the love of the Father. And what do we say out in the world? I could be wrong. The very next day we go to work, you know, I could be wrong, but if I'm wrong, I die, rot in the ground, where is it my body? If I'm right, I get to go to heaven forever with God. If you're right, you die, rot in the ground, where is it your body? If you're wrong, you go to hell. What have you got to lose? The day before in church, we're talking about the certainty of God's existence, and the very next day we reduce him to a probability. We say we could be wrong. 
brothers and sisters, if you could be wrong about the existence of God, you cannot say nothing can separate me from the love of the Father, because you could be wrong. In church, we have no, t- no problem talking about a certainty. In the world, we reduce God to a probability, because you know what, then you're, then you're welcome at parties. If you show up at a party, I could be wrong, but you know, this has made my life good, and I'm, I'm probably going to heaven if this is all true. Come on right in. If you say God certainly exists, and you certainly need a savior, or certainly going to hell for your sin against the God you know exists, then you're not welcome at parties anymore. A lot of Christians prefer the previous one because they want entrance to those parties. But we cannot compromise the gospel. We cannot compromise the truth of God's word just for our, our own acceptance. It's not a popularity contest. Now, there might be people here, and I've heard this from Christians, who say, I'm really not certain that God exists. I've heard that from people who are professing Christians. And I do believe that they are Christians because the world has duped them into saying something that's not true. The world has duped them into professing something that is not certain. But I have one word of advice for somebody who says to me, I'm not really certain that God exists. Repent. And I'm not, say, I'm not saying repent unto salvation, but repent. Now this is the question that I ask people, I ask it on the street because a lot of Christians get it wrong, is repent is something you say, something you think, or something you do. And Christians will say something you do, and that's actually false. Repentance comes from the Greek word metanoia, which means to change your mind. Repentance is something you think. And this is the question that I ask people. How can you change what you think about God? You're commanded to, but how can you do it? You can't. Repentance is the gift of God. You need to get on your knees and beg him to change your mind about what you're saying about him, what you're thinking about him. If you're professing something that's not certain, beg God to change your mind. Because he is certain and you know it. Everyone knows it, but they're without excuse for suppressing that, for their sin against the God they know exists. Now here's the question. Can God make us certain? Can God make us certain? See, that's the question that I used to ask when I was out on the street. Because I want to get to which worldview can make us certain, which worldview can account for knowledge. And I'll say to the unbeliever, can God make us certain? And they sure, say, sure, if he exists. But I don't do that anymore. I ask a much simpler question, because you might run in, even into a debate with this. And sometimes I will ask this question. But this is the question I ask them. Is it impossible for God to exist? Of course, we know that they know that God exists, but they're likely concede, to concede the possibility for God to exist. Is it impossible for God to exist? No, of course not. You'd have to have all knowledge to know that there's no God. Is it impossible for God to exist? No, it's not. Well, with the possibility that God exists, they've conceded us an, an avenue to certainty because God makes us certain. That's what he does. So I just say, is it impossible for God to exist? They've already conceded that I can have certainty. It's like God makes us certain. And I tell them that I read them a verse from Scripture, from uh, Luke 1. Therefore, I, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. I don't know why people don't name their kid Theophilus. It's a great name. So that you may know a certainty the things that you have been taught. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them, accepted them with, and they accepted them. They knew a certainty that I came from you. John 17, verse 6 and 8, 6 to 8. Let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made them both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Scripture talks about certainty. God makes us certain. Now the unbeliever might say to you, well, I don't believe in that God. It's impossible for that God to exist. You say, well, how, how do you know that for certain? <laughs> so that's the question I ask them. And they'll normally concede that, no, it's not impossible for God to exist. I just don't, don't believe him. I say, that's fine. But you're saying it's, it's not impossible. Therefore, I can have certainty. You've conceded an avenue to certain, and that's going to come into play later on when we talk about actually engaging the unbeliever. Now, here's the question. How does God make us certain? You might get that question on the street. How does God make you certain? And you know what I say? I make the lights go off. <laughs> you know what I say? How, God, how does God make you certain? I don't know. I don't know how God makes me certain. But you know what? I don't know how God made a cow either. But I know God made the cow. Can I know that God made the cow without knowing how he made the cow? Of course. Can I know that God made me certain without knowing how he made me certain? Of course I can. How does God make us as Christians certain? I have no idea. He uses means. He uses revelation. He makes us certain, epistemically certain of some things. Which things? The things that he wants us to be certain of. I have an avenue to certainty because I'm a Christian. Now, you might be sitting there and say, well, what about faith? Aren't we supposed to have faith? I mean, we have certainty with our reasoning up to a certain degree, and then faith takes over. That's where we make the leap of of faith to God because, you know, it completes our worldview. People talk about that, about the three-legged stool. All you need is Christ, you know, to sturdy up that stool. 
that faith that you need that takes over when the reasoning is let, leaves off. But how do we as Christians define faith? Brothers and sisters, faith does not take over where reason leaves off. Christian faith is the foundation of all reasoning. Hebrews 11 verse 1, this is uh, the um, NIV. It's my favorite translation of this verse. And this is actually the old NIV. I think they've changed it in the new one. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Christian faith is a certainty. It's the foundation of all certainty. Without God, you can't know anything for certain. Faith in God is the foundation of all certainty, of all knowledge. The unbeliever have, has knowledge too. How can that be? The unbeliever is also certain that God exists. Faith in God is the foundation for the unbeliever's reasoning too. From him, through him, and to him are all things. Now that might be a shocking thing to know, that the reason that the unbeliever can know things is because they do have faith in God, but they suppress that in unrighteousness. Now I want to go back to some of the things I talked about yesterday. One of the problems with evidence is that you reduce God to a probability. And the reason I'm playing these uh, clips is, like I say, not to poke these people in the eye, but a lot of times what people will do after they hear a talk on, um, what am I teaching? Apologetics. <laughs> they'll go home and they'll Google apologetics and they'll see all these different apologists and say, oh, this is pretty good, this is pretty good. But I want to play certain clips so you're aware of what they're actually saying, so that your eyebrow will raise and you'll say, that's not the God I believe in. Now this is a fellow here, he was doing a debate, and I actually contacted him because I think it's not really fair for me to use clips of people without contacting them and without going over what they said, but two hours I talked with him on Skype and he stuck to his guns, this is what he believes. And this was him at a uh, recent debate. I'm not sure how many minds are ever changed by debates like this, but I think it's valuable to keep the conversation going. One thing is certain, this will not be settled tonight. God's existence or non-existence cannot be proven with certainty. That is the domain of things like math. When it comes to the existence of quarks, love, the theory of evolution, whether Elvis actually died, and the existence of God, we're dealing in probabilities. That's the Christian debates you hear out there. When, when we're dealing with the existence of God, we're dealing in probabilities. Now, um, I was researching for my debate with Matt Delahunty, and I looked at one of his old debates, and I came across this clip. I believe it was Michael Horner that said that uh, the world is all about probabilities, and if God is more probable than improbable, then God is true. Um, they also say, the yes side says, that atheists uh, who think there is no evidence for God, they're actually agnostics. Um, when you say that God is probable, are you not yourself then an agnostic? No, not at all. The, the argument that, uh, that I gave, uh, let's just take, take the first one. Uh, whatever begins to exist must have a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause, and then I drew some attributes out of that. Um, that's a deductive argument, but we don't know the premises with, with absolute certainty. So that means that the uh, conclusion is, uh, is, is not known with absolute certainty. But it is still, if the premises are true, then the uh, conclusion uh, is true because it's, it's a valid argument. Certainty, probability has to do with how much certitude we have towards something that is, that is true. And so it just, it follows that we have in, in that argument a good argument that shows that it's highly probable that God exists more probable than he doesn't because the premises are more probably true than their denials. And so the conclusion is as well. So it's more probable that God exists than that he doesn't. Nothing can separate me from the love of the Father. It's more probable that God exists than he doesn't. They're not talking about the God we worship in church. And this is Mike Horner and Paul Chamberlain, and they're debating Matt Delahunty and uh, Chris DiCarlo. Now, listen to this next question that came out of the audience. I won't play all of their response, but listen to this next question from an unbeliever. And it was a brilliant question. I thought, this is what that kind of theology leads to. Hi, uh, you talked about probabilities uh, and that uh, the existence of God is more probable than not. Um, to extrapolate that, what then is the probability that homosexuality is bad? What's the probability that Jesus died for your sins? What's the probability that it's okay to beat your children? What is the probability that people should be killed for not going to church? Now, of course, you know, he, he took it and ran with it and things that the Bible does not say. But the early things, what's the probability that homosexuality is wrong? What's the probability that Jesus rose from the dead? If it's only probable that God exists, all those things are probable. You can't have assurance of salvation if it's only probable. I see, that's a difficulty. Here's J.P. Moreland at one of his talks. If you ask me why I believe in God, 
I would say because the evidence for God is better than the evidence against God. He believes in God because the preponderance of the evidence. You know, I don't think that's the case for any of them. I would ask him, what evidence could convince you that Christianity is not true? And I would, I would be confident in saying there's no evidence that could convince me it's not true. Then why are you saying this? Why are you saying because the world has duped us into saying this, into defending a probability? The unbeliever wins if you defend your faith like that. See, what if I told you that I had a wonderful, loving relationship with my wife? I'm just not certain she exists. See, you have every right to question my relationship, if not my sanity. And this is how people are talking about God. Not certain that God exists. Even the best known, most feared Christian apologist in the world, William Lane Craig. That's, that's the whole point. We don't claim certainty. And that's great. Well, do you claim certainty? No, no. I, this is... I, I don't get that. In no, are you certain that God exists? No. Good. Are you certain that God exists? No. And what does the atheist say? Good. No kidding. Good. He's one. Here's a one-minute apologist. I haven't watched a lot of theirs, but this one was on doubt. Welcome to the One Minute Apologist. One minute apologist. Apologetics seeks to give credible answers to curious questions, to give a defense. Buddhists have doubts. Mormons have doubts. JWs have doubts. Agnostics have doubts. And atheists have doubts. And even Christians have doubts. There's no way to get away from having doubts because there's no way to have 100% certainty. And Christianity helps us to bridge the difference through faith in reasonable evidence. This next clip, um, Greg Kokel, I spent a wonderful hour and a half in a car with him. I drove him to the airport in Philly once from one of the conferences. Wonderful man, wonderful uh, conversation that we had. But this is what he says about doubt. Do I believe he's a brother? Yes, I do. I think that some of the people in the room are probably friends with him. And I'm not doing this to poke him in the eye, but I just want you to be aware of some of the things that he says. Uh, Dan is concerned about the uh, habit of some apologists, including myself, and he mentions J.P. Moreland and William Lane Craig, uh, who who say at different times that we could be mistaken about our views. And doesn't this undermine our own confidence in views, our own certainty, and doesn't this maybe cause doubt with other Christians? And I guess the response is, it may cause doubt for other people. I guess that's possible. I have qualified convictions, that my convictions are qualified by my evidence, and they're qualified by an awareness of my, uh, my ignorance, the possibility I could be mistaken. So I am open to talking about the ideas and to have an exchange of ideas, and in principle at least, if you could persuade me otherwise, you give you good reasons otherwise, I'm open to something to see the other side. Uh, that's an open-mindedness. That's an appropriate open-mindedness. Open-minded about the existence of God. I could be convinced otherwise. I don't believe that he could. I really don't. But if that's true, he's the judge, based on the preponderance of the evidence. I just believe that these people are inconsistent, as I was. Was I certain that God exists when I talked like this? Absolutely. Why do I talk like that? That's, the world want, that's what the world wants to hear. What does Scripture say about doubt? James 1, verse 5 to 8, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. These people are saying it's a good thing to doubt. Brothers and sisters, doubt is a sin. Doubt is a sin. But what does Scripture also say? Be merciful with those who doubt. And why that is, I think that's because the world has duped them, has put them in a place. You know, maybe it's a psychological trouble that they're having. They're going through something that causes them to doubt. But make no mistake, doubt is a sin. And if any of you out there are having doubts, I want to offer you some comfort. Because this is what I say to people who are having doubts. I say, what are you doubting? You're doubting the truth of God's existence. You're using your reasoning. You're using knowledge. You're using logic. What do all of those things presuppose? For all of those things, you need God. You need God to doubt God. Doubt makes mo no sense in a worldview without God. So that's a comfort. If you're doubting, you know God exists with certainty because doubt presupposes God. Now, what does Scripture say? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We didn't get into that yesterday, so I want to elaborate on that a little bit today. Why is that the case? 
Why is God the foundation of our knowledge? Well, I want to give you an analogy which may help you. Here's the question. How do I know A? How do I know that I'm standing up here talking to you? Well, my senses are telling me that. How do I know my senses are valid? Well, because of B. Because I went to the doctor and he gave me a good checkup and you know, he said everything's working fine. How do I know the doctor's not lying to me? Well, because of C. Because if he would lie, he would lose his license, you know, and then, well, how do you know that I care, that he cares that he loses his license? Well, because of D, because he's a family. And, well, how do I know that? How do I know that? Because of E, because of F, because of G, because of H, because of I, how do I know? On and on and on, etc. An infinite regress. How do you know that? Because of that, because of that, because of that. Now, how do you get rid of that infinite regress? Because that would happen with any knowledge claim. How do you know this? Because of this, because of this, because of this. In order to know anything at all, you would have to have infinite knowledge to end that infinite regress. In order to anything, know anything, you'd have to have infinite knowledge. You'd have to know everything. Now, here's another way of looking at it. Imagine all the available knowledge in the world represented by that pie chart there. Now, it would be very generous to say that we thought we had 1% of all available knowledge, that one little sliver there. That would be arrogant to say that we had 1%, or we thought we had 1% of all available knowledge. Now, wouldn't it be possible that the other 99% could contradict the 1% that we thought we had? One thing I want to caution people to, because I've heard people say this on the street, and they say, could you be wrong about everything you know? And the answer to that is no, because knowledge is true. You can't be wrong about anything you know, but you can be wrong about things you think you know. So just make sure that you make that clarification, that qualification. So if you think you have 1% of all the knowledge, wouldn't it follow that the other 99% could contradict what you think you have? Sure. So what's the answer? Either the infinite regress or you know, the percentage of knowledge. In order to know anything, you would have to know everything. Now this is where I hope it hits home for everybody. And sometimes, you know, it might take a while for that, that switch to go in your head. In order to know anything, you'd have to know everything. Or have a revelation from someone who does. Brothers and sisters, that is our worldview. We have revelation from God who knows everything. Who knows everything? God. God knows everything. We have revelation from God who knows everything. That's why we can know things. That's why the unbeliever can know things too, but they suppress that. So in order to know anything, you would have to be God or have revelation from God. Now the question becomes, do unbelievers know anything? Well, the doctor that took out my appendix eight years ago now, I didn't ask if he was a Christian. I didn't put my hands on the either side of the operating room as they were wheeling me in. I got to know if he's a Christian. I want to know if he knows things. Do unbelievers know anything? Sure. He might have been an unbelieving doctor, but if he knew anything, it wasn't because his worldview is true. It's because ours is, brothers and sisters. That's why they can know things. How can that be? How can it be that they can know anything since you have to know God to know anything? Take you back to Romans chapter 1. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. It's because they know the truth. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. Now, I won't get into it now, but in the Q&A, if somebody wants to remind me, I'll tell you the difference between R.C. Sproul and William Lane Cre uh, and R.C. Sproul and Greg Bonson as far as Romans 1 goes. is the difference between immediate and immediate knowledge, but just if somebody wants to bring that up in the Q&A, because I never understood the difference, but now you'll understand the difference between two Reformed theologians who differ on Romans 1, but I just don't have time to get into it right now. So here's the question. What kind of knowledge does the unbeliever have? 1 Timothy 6, verse 20. O Timothy, guard the deposit and trust it to you. Avoid their irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. Paul is warning Timothy. This is not new, brothers and sisters. Like I said, this is the FedEx, and you'll see it just jump out of you. Paul was warning Timothy against false knowledge. Now, what is false knowledge? See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. It's right there, black and white. Paul was already warning here to the Colossians. See to it that no one takes you captive by vain philosophy, by knowledge not founded on Christ. What kind of knowledge do they have? False knowledge. They depend on things, their autonomous reasoning, their sense and reasoning. They don't depend on Christ who knows everything. So what are we supposed to do when we're out in the street? Of course, and one thing I want to caution you and remind you, if any of this takes you away from reciting scripture when you answer the unbeliever, forget it. Leave it. This is nice to know in the back of your mind. Maybe it will come up in your conversation. But if this is your conversation, forget it. 
Because a lot of people hear this apologetic and they fall in love with the apologetic instead of the Lord of the apologetic. So you know when I know that people get this apologetic is not when they can win arguments. It's when they love God more. Because he has commanded us to defend our faith and he's also equipped us. Don't fall in love with the apologetic. This will help maybe in some of these uh, arguments. But if it takes you away from scripture, forget it. So our job is to make the unbeliever epistemologically self-conscious. I want to throw that in there because the first time I heard I didn't know what he's talking about. But we want to make them consider how they know what they know. Make them self-conscious about how they know what they know because they do know things. They have false knowledge, but they do know things. Now, probably best at this time to uh, define knowledge. And people, you know, when I'm out in the street and asking how they know what they know. And this is the standard definition of knowledge from uh, Plato, ancient Greek philosopher from uh, 300, 400 BC. Justified true belief. Now, out in the street, that's the definition that I use, justified true belief. Some people say warranted true belief. There's not universal agreement on this definition. But I've never run into anyone who said that knowledge does not have to be true. So that's the question I'll ask. Does knowledge have to be true? What are you talking about? A lot of people don't know what you're talking about. But I say, let me ask you this question. Can I know that Elvis Presley is the current president of the United States? No. I can't know that. Why not? Because it's not true. Knowledge must be true. So we get back to the true move uh, checkmate. That's not what the Bible says. I don't believe your Bible's true. How do you get truth without God? I want to play a couple of clips from some uh, debates that I did on the podcast. This guy is way smarter than I am. I don't doubt it. And I asked him what truth was in his worldview. And this is what he said. And if your mind goes in circles, don't try and figure it out. Now, maybe we right. can get to this topic. What is truth according to your worldview? The truth is, I think, the pursuit of truth. No, no, I don't, I'm not interested in the pursuit of truth. I'd like to know what is truth. No, it's a perfectly valid question. Worldview. It's a perfectly valid question. I, I, the truth is, how, how can I, in this brief time that I have, uh, in this only life that I'm going to get, how can I possibly make an impact on people which doesn't prevent them from fulfilling their own Destiny. How do, how do I how do I carve a niche for myself, which doesn't negatively impact upon the niche that somebody else is kind of t- trying to carve for themselves? Jim, now, Jim, if the, uh, if the method by which you do that and seek that truth, seeker of truth, you know, there's, there's a the word a word for that in um, I think it's Aramaic, is it Aramaic? Sufi, Sufism. Mm-hmm. If if the seeker of truth is genuine in that pursuit, then anything that gets in the way of that path of that drive of that desire to just be a a, a a a positive force for good is no matter what gets in the way it's irrelevant that was his definition of truth i just asked him what truth was and we had i don't know a few minutes of just babble ridiculous so i asked him again what is truth according to your worldview okay the truth is things that are important to you not just because you know they're important to other people but because without them you wouldn't be able to formulate a an impression or a care for the rest of your life the rest of the things that you have in in your day if if it wasn't true for me that every time i look up the moon that it really is there however many thousands of kilometers away it is if if it wasn't true that the sun is 96 million kilometers away then I would want to know by what means we would explain why it isn't true there would always have to be, I think, a mechanism by which something could be explained to me. So I, th- I think the truth is the mechanism by which we explain things. So truth is a mechanism now. Both philosophical and scientific and emotional. And I realize that these, are, that these words are loaded with certain logical mm-hmm. fallacy terminology as well. And, and uh, you know, it's not that you know, no man's an island. We're, we're all uh, succumb to certain kinds of logical biases of one kind or another. 
But well, just, just on so the hoof, just, try and answer your question right, right off the top of my head. That's my answer. Uh, if in 10 years' time I listen back to myself and think, you idiot, how could you possibly not just pick up on that straight away, then so be it. But right here, right now, that's my answer to your question. And this man says the Bible's not true. What is truth? And I played the whole thing because it's babble. It's ridiculous. They, on a later podcast, said I was flailing around when I heard that question. He doesn't know what truth is, and he wants to say my Bible's not true. Now, one thing, I don't want to put people on the spot, because if you asked me 10 years ago what truth was, I couldn't answer you. I would have looked like an idiot, too. I'm so thankful for Christians who are not aware of this philosophy, whatever God says. Amen. Can you define that? Can you describe it? No, but I know what true is, whatever God says. See, that's sufficient. Now, these people, like I say, flailing around. That's how easy it is. And I don't put these people on the spot. When I, I even offer them a definition of truth, and I did on this podcast as well. Uh, Dustin Seegers and I were debating these fellows, and we said, is truth that which corresponds with reality? And um, the one fellow said, no. <laughs> now that's how he defines truth. But I'll even say that on the campuses, is truth that which corresponds to reality? And they'll say, yes, and I have no problem with that. I believe truth is what is real. Here's the question. Real to who? Hindus will say all of this is illusion. All of it's maya. You know, and somebody who's colorblind might say that that banner over there is green. And I'll say it's right. True to who? It has to be a perfect perceiver. So my favorite definition of truth was this. Truth is that which corresponds to reality as perceived by God. Because he's the perfect perceiver and he can let us know what's true. That used to be my favorite definition, and I think it's still a good definition, but I think it adds an unnecessary step that God must actually perceive it for it to be true. And I know that what the people are saying who define it this way, and I, like I said, I don't have a problem with it. But my favorite definition now is truth is whatever conforms to the mind of God. And like you would have said if I put you on the spot without hearing this lecture, truth is whatever God says. Amen. Whatever God says is true. Now, like I said, here's uh, four claims you might hear on the street. You can't know anything at all. Can't know anything for certain. Everything is relative. Or I can know things without God. Now, you get somebody who says, I can't know anything at all. I was explaining this apologetic to Eric Hoven, my friend down in Florida, and uh, he was debating people online for like two in the morning who said, you can't know anything at all. And he had to drive his daughter, Stephanie, to school the next day. So he woke up and he's still bleary eyed. He only had a few hours sleep and he made cereal for her and he poured it and he pushed it over to her. And he asked, he said, Stephanie, you know, I was up last night debating with people, seven years old, his daughter, by the way. I was up last night debating with people who say that they can't know anything to be true. You know what she said? How do they know that? Seven years old. People who say they can't know anything to be true. How do they know that? That's the response. It's absurd. When someone says they can't know anything to be true, that's a knowledge claim. Then you get people who say, well, we just can't know anything for certain. And like I say, degrees of certainty, I, you know, I can't get into that now. And I get a lot of criticism for that. I say that it doesn't matter if knowledge has to be certain. The unbeliever, unless they start with God, can't know anything to any degree. But you get people out there who say that you can't know anything for certain. And that happened in my first debate with Paul Baird. I, th I think the two arguments that I will put back to you, Sai, are miracles and intercessionary prayer. There you have two instances where something should happen and there is a probability that something might happen. But that's as far as you go. There is no certainty. Are you certain about that? <laughs> <laughs> he said to me, there is no certainty. What do most Christians Well, I guess, you know, I just said, are you certain about that? You can't answer that. He just started laughing. He had no answer for that. And this fellow, the one that I was arguing with about the Santa quote, I also asked him about certainty. This one was in the film because, you know, we weren't yelling at each other at this point. You're saying that my reasoning is the reason why the stuff doesn't work. You're saying, no, that's not what I'm saying, you're saying that You're saying that I can't be certain of anything because it's based on my own reasoning. But you can't be certain God exists because you reading the Bible Listen, is based on you your own reasoning. You just said I can have certainty, right? I can say you have certainty if you know God exists. Right. But the fact that you think God exists is based on okay, your so own nobody reasoning. Can, so nobody can have certainty? Nobody can have certainty. Are right? you certain of that? And I'm certain of it. Thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. That's right. <laughs> you just proved yourself wrong. You just proved that you're a hypocrite. You just proved... You got the cameraman laughing. Yeah, I know. Show these people the video. Can't know anything for certain, and I'm certain of that. Brothers and sisters, that's what we're dealing with out there. We don't have to be afraid to talk to the unbeliever. Unbelief is folly. What about Dan Barker? He used to be a... Says he was a, a Christian. He never was. But he was a pastor for something like 20 years. 
And I engaged him on Apologia Radio on the Jeff Durbin show, and I missed his sermon, but I'm looking forward to listening to the tape because I hear it was outstanding. But I got to engage Dan Barker, brilliant man. He's not this kid that I meet at the campus at Temple University. He's a brilliant man. Listen to him talking about certainty. We round it off. We go with it. Although we all have to admit that we are not absolutely certain. But are you, you can certain be, that we have to admit that, Dan? I'm very certain that we have to admit that. Yes, you but have to, you're, you're, you're certain just digging this. To admit that we don't have certainty. Don't you see a problem there? You see, folks, that's the folly of atheism, and people are I, paying five thousand dollars a seat to listen to that nonsense. I was a little steamed at that point, uh, but now, but <laughs> but he was. Speaking at the Reason Rally the next day, which I renamed the Treason Rally, I made a sign. I, but um, so he was speaking there, and people were paying five thousand dollars a seat to sit in the little front section there. And this is a man who says he's certain that you can't have certainty. You know, when I ran into these people at the Reason Rally, the heads of these atheistic organizations, I thought, okay, now it's going to be a debate, because all their peons, you know, that they don't know the arguments. These guys are going to have trouble with. Brothers and sisters, it's all the same. The smarter they are, they just use bigger words to hide their, fooli their, their folly, their foolishness. And you might get people on the street who say everything is relative, or they say there is no absolute truth. And if you get people like that, you just send them to my website. <laughs> For those of you who aren't familiar with the website, I'll take you uh, uh, quickly through that. This is how you answer the relativist. This is a question that you confront when you uh, go to my website. And uh, four questions, you have to click on one of them. Absolute truth exists. I don't know if abs or absolute truth does not exist. I don't know if absolute truth exists, and I don't care if absolute truth exists. And you have to click on one of them. Now, people know where this is going. I define absolute truth as something that is true for all people at all times everywhere. You'd have to be God to know that. So they think it's a trick right off to begin with. So they click on absolute truth does not exist, and it takes them to this page. Absolute truth does not exist, absolutely true or false. Because to say that there's no absolute truth is to make an absolute truth claim. So you click either one of those buttons, and it takes you back to the first page or it used to, but I got email after email after email, your website is broken. <laughs> I said, no friend, your thinking is broken. <laughs> so I actually had to put in another page just to stop these emails from coming, so it doesn't take them back to the first page, now it takes them to this page. This is not a glitch, think about it. <laughs> so at this point they say, well I can't say absolute truth does not exist because I end up in this loop, so I guess they say, I don't know if absolute truth exists and it takes them to this page. I don't know if absolute truth exists, absolutely true or false. To say that you don't know something is to make a truth claim. It's absurd, so it takes them back to the front page. And by this time they get all frustrated and they say, well, I guess I don't care if absolute truth exists, and it takes them to Disney. <laughs> now I get Christians that are upset with me for that. They're saying you're mocking unbelief. I say, you know, if Disney was around at the time of the Apostle Paul, he might have said if Christ is not raised, basically if what we believe is not true, you might as well go to Disney for tomorrow we die. Your best life now. If this is your best life now, you're on your way to hell. You might as well go to Disney for tomorrow we die. And it's the atheists who go back to the website at that point. That's just the entry to the website. But that's how you deal with the relativist. You show the folly of relativism. They're absolute about the relativism, which is crazy. Now you get people who say that we can know things without God. And again, the two-move checkmate. How do you get truth without God? And they'll say, well, truth is that which corresponds to reality. And sometimes I give them that definition. Is that what you believe? Yes, that's what I believe. Truth is that which corresponds to reality. Great. How do you know what's real? How do you know what's real? Well, I use my senses, my memory, and my reasoning. How do you know your senses, memory, and reasoning are valid? Unless you start with God. Well, I sense that my senses are valid. I remember that my memory is valid. I reason that my reasoning is valid. And if they don't see what the problem with that, no sense in continuing. They're using their senses to prove their senses. Now, sometimes I'll say to uh, the person that I'm talking to, um, would you agree that there's people in this world who have invalid reasoning? Yes, I would. Now, those people could not know that they're people with invalid reasoning because you would need valid reasoning to conclude that. If you had invalid reasoning, you could never know it. And I say, would you agree that there's people like that? And they say, yes. I say, how do you know you're not one of those people? They say, I don't. You need to repent. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And you do know things because you, know you, you know the God that exists. James Randi, brilliant man. He debunks you know, the Peter Popovs, the fake faith healers and that. And I bumped into him at the Reason Rally. Brilliant man. He's people that debunking fake Christians. And I posted this video on YouTube and uh, I said uh, James Randi exposes himself. And I think people clicked on it for the wrong reasons, but uh, 
It's with James Randi. My question to you, sir, is how do you know that your reasoning is valid? Reasoning about what? About anything. Your ability to reason. I don't know that it's valid okay, until I right. test it. Well, the thing is, you test your, your reasoning using your reasoning. Yes. And that's viciously circular. Yes, we're, we're talking in a circle here now. That's right. You're using your reasoning. Two equals two equals two equals two equals two. Right, we can do that forever. But you're using your reasoning to validate your reasoning. Don't you see a problem with that? No, I don't see any problem with that. Your okay. solution is revelation. That's right. right. Yeah. So yeah. I could say, if I said God exists because God exists, you would have a problem with that. I have a problem with that because That's I right. don't see any evidence. I know, of but it. the thing is, what is the evidence that your reasoning is valid? <laughs> We're talking in circles now. That's right. This yeah. is very juvenile, and I don't get involved in juvenile arguments. See, he doesn't get involved in juvenile arguments, he can't answer them. Now, he's, he's getting old, so he had a handler with him, and you hear, you hear what he yelled out in the background, you appeal to revelation. I said, that's right. I would love to have a conversation with that guy. He's more honest about it. <laughs> Without revelation, you can't know anything. These people know that God exists. Now, you might get somebody on the street, I'll go through this very quickly since we're running out of time, and they'll say, well, I know I exist. I know I exist, that's all I can know. I know that I exist. I say, well, how do you know that? And they quote Rene Descartes, I think, therefore I am. I think, therefore, I am. You think, well, that makes sense. I'm thinking, therefore, I know that I exist. There's actually an atheistic philosopher that refuted Bertrand Russell, uh, um, refuted Rene Descartes. His name is Bertrand Russell. And he broke it down into a logical syllogism. Premise one, I think. Premise two, in order to think, I must exist. Conclusion, therefore, I exist. Is that basically, that's what I ask people on the campus who say, I think, therefore, I am. Is this basically what you're saying? They say, yeah, that's it. I say, look at your conclusion. Therefore, I exist. Look at your first premise. I think. They're assuming their existence in the first premise. They're saying, I think. Now, if you want to forget that, you can forget that, but it's, they're begging the question. They're assuming that they exist. To not beg the question, this syllogism should be, there is thinking going on in the first premise. And how do you get from there is thinking going on to I exist? You can't. And it was an atheist that um, exposed the uh, fallacy of that claim. Now, you'll get people out there who say, well, truth is whatever works. They're pragmatists. They say, you know, I don't... I think that truth is whatever works. And I say, okay, so you're a pragmatist. And I do this on the college campuses, and I'll say to them, look, let's say that you finish school here and you're out of work, and I happen to own the local Blark factory, and I'm gonna give you a job, and I'm gonna give you a job in quality control. So I put you into this room and there's a conveyor belt, and I give you a lab coat, and all these Blarks are coming in on the conveyor belt, and I want you to tell me whether or not they work. What's your first question gonna be to me? What's a blark? Right there. <laughs> That's a blark. What's your next question going to be? What's it supposed to do? Brothers and sisters, pragmatism can tell you a lot of things, but it can't tell you what it's supposed to do. For that, you need God. How is it supposed to work? They have no idea unless they start with God. Pragmatism fails. The question is, do unbelievers know anything? I ran into P.Z. Myers at the Reason Rally. How do you know that your ability to reason is valid? <laughs> okay, see yes. <laughs> Because I'm not a slimy <laughs> like you. Okay, <laughs> this is the type of argumentation that you need. Ad hominem. That's right. Right, logical see, because the thing is, yeah. what this man has to do is employ his reasoning to justify his reasoning. That's why he no, won't no, answer no, my No, 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 because you said such absurd things that I do not have to employ my reasoning. I can just How do you know that your reasoning is I can simply laugh and chew you away. How do you know that your reasoning You're is You're a very, very silly man. Well, I test, I test my reasoning empirically. With your reasoning. Do you need your reasoning when you do that? So what? Are all things known empirically? Like I said, could you be wrong about everything you claim to know? Not about everything, no. Okay, what do you know for certain and how do you know it? What, what are you driving at? All I asked him is what he knows and how he knows it. He started swearing at me. He talked about this on his blog and he said that that was the fourth time I ran into him and I was just pestering him. That was actually the second time and the first time he swore at me too. All I want to know is how do you know, what do you know and how do you know it? Without God, they can't answer that question. Brothers and sisters, the fool that has said in his heart, there is no God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. God is not the conclusion to the argument. He's the necessary starting point. From him, through him, and to him are all things. All things include my ability to reason 
and the unbelievers' ability to reason. Do not give them the tools of Jesus Christ to argue against Jesus Christ. God is not a God that you can reason to. He's the God that you can't reason without. Brothers and sisters, that's the God that I believe in. And I trust that that's a God that all of you believe in. God is not at the end of an intellectual argument. He's at the beginning of any thought. He's at the beginning of reasoning. Brothers and sisters, that's the God that we need to represent when we're out there. Do it biblically. It's nice to have these things in your back pocket, but that's where the power of your reasoning is. That's where the power of our argument is in the truth of Scripture. Let's close with prayer. Lord God, I thank you for this time that we could spend together. Oh, Lord God, how I hope that we leave here better equipped to serve you, Lord God, that we might see your glory and your greatness, and that we could talk about you to our unbelieving, our professed unbelieving friends, Lord God, with full confidence, knowing that you will give us the words, Lord God, but we must trust that we represent you honestly. That although, Lord God, we've been speaking incorrectly about you in the past, that we might repent of that, Lord God, and just go out in boldness to speak of you, Lord God, and, and let your Holy Spirit work in their hearts, and to know that salvation is out of our hands, Lord God, but that at least now we're talking about you biblically, honestly, and we hope and pray that you honor that, Lord God. We thank you for this time that we could spend together, Lord God, and please bless the rest of this conference and the rest of the speakers, and we pray this all in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.